This is CBC Here and Now. So will you concede that if indeed a, a P-70 to P-50? Now, I've had it. I've had this foolishness. I've had it, Mr. Martin. Fed up at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Commissioner Richard LeBlanc scolds Ed Martin while he was on the stand. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, we start tonight with a blow up at the Muskrat Falls inquiry. Commissioner Richard LeBlanc tore into Ed Martin, calling him rude and unresponsive and saying that he's fed up with Mr. Martin's foolishness. The dramatic development came late this afternoon as questions about the cost estimates of the controversial project were being put to the former head of NALCOR. Here's how it all unfolded. Uh, first off, I, I, put, <coughs> start the fuel for I put absolutely no credence in P70 to 90 from Mr. Mallon, and I've said why, so that's not on. Um, well, so let's, I, let's assume for the sake of argument, because there's, I mean, it's either right or it's wrong. It's answerable. So let's assume, and, and again, if I'm wrong. I will not assume it because it's wrong. I'm asking you to assume. I'm not going to have So will you concede that if indeed a, a P70 to P90? Now, I've had, I've had this foolishness. I've had Mr. Martin. You're not being the witness here. You're trying to run the show. It's going to stop right now. And if it doesn't stop, unfortunately, I won't be able to hear the rest of your story. Now, I've had it. I've listened. I've been very patient. I've tried very hard to take notes of everything you've said because I wanted to know it. But I don't like the attitude that you're displaying here, to be quite frank. You are not responsive to the questions. You're actually being rude as far as I'm concerned. And I don't want it anymore. I wouldn't put up with it in court, and I'm not going to put up with it here. So we're going to take five minutes because I need to cool off. And then we're going to come back and it's going to shift from what, what's been going on. And we're going to go through this in a way that we can look like professionals, even if we don't. That's it. Five minutes. All right. So, as you could tell, it became quite tense inside the inquiry room today. This was the third day of testimony for Martin, who insisted the province's future is bright because of Muskrat Falls. And that's despite the massive cost hike as well as the schedule overruns. Martin says it is still the only option that makes sense. Mark Quinn joins us now live to talk about today. Mark, quite the scene. That's right, Debbie, and already Ed Martin is taking a real thrashing on social media, but his position on Muskrat Falls hasn't changed. Now, of course, it's something he's been fighting with critics on for about a decade, and today Martin explained why he launched a campaign in 2011 to defend this me mega project. There was a tremendous amount of Muskrat Falls bullshit going on, so that's what caused it. Critics were talking about hydro rates doubling and calling for the project to be shelved. As Martin sees it, the battle against what he calls BS continues. I personally, you know, cannot see a rational uh, alternative. Costs have blown up from 6.2 billion to 12.7 billion, and the project is at least two years behind schedule. And I believe, for the first time in history, um, we are in the right place. We are control our own electricity, the oil is expanding, the future is, uh, is bright. A big deal has been made of what Martin did or didn't tell government, but here's his advice to politicians now. For my money, uh, fooling with that right now, because we are well positioned, would be absolutely crazy. Uh, we should hold the course, get the ratepayers taken care of, uh, take advantage of the position we put ourselves in, and keep moving and do not acquiesce uh, to making any rash decisions right now with the Upper Churchill. Now Martin is due to testify again tomorrow and critics said they'll have more to say when he's done. Anthony and Debbie, back to you. All right, what the uh, tempest at the inquiry and a lot of wind with the weather as well. Pretty stormy just about everywhere. The snow started on the Avalon earlier this afternoon. So of course we did what we do. We stick our meteorologist Ashley Brawler out in that weather. So Ashley, what can we expect for tonight? 
Yeah, it is windy out here. My eyes are starting to water. So if it looks like I'm crying, I'm not actually crying. Uh, but it is looking like things are getting a little bit worse. Those winds are going to continue to pick up as we head through the night tonight. Uh, St. John's Airport's already reported about four centimeters of snow, well on our way to close to 10 centimeters. And then uh, it does look like the most amount of snow will fall down through the southeastern portion of the Avalon. Could see upwards of about 20 centimeters by tonight. But again, it's those winds. So they're going to continue to pick up. Gusting between 70 and 90 kilometers per hour means reduced visibilities as we're heading through the next couple of hours. Eventually, this will taper off after midnight, but it does look like more blowing snow by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And then eventually we're going to see some clearing for the rest of the province for the most part. Labrador looks like a nice evening for the most part, but I will have all of these details. Your full forecast will look a little bit ahead to the weekend because maybe some of this snow might be gone, but I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. How's this for holiday cheer? Deserving family receives an unexpected Christmas gift. And let me give you a hint. It has four wheels and a set of keys. You can hear that ahead on here and now. Well, tonight, here and now can bring you new details on a fatal shooting in Cornerbrook. Jordan McKay was shot during a confrontation with police at his apartment in late November. He died a short time later at hospital. Here now's Arianna Kelland has more. It's been two weeks since a Royal Newfoundland Constabulary officer shot and killed 25-year-old Jordan McKay. The RNC isn't saying much, neither is the investigating force, the Ontario Provincial Police. But sources confirm it involved a new male recruit and a more senior female officer. Sources say those officers went to Jordan McKay's Cornerbrook apartment twice the day of the shooting. Once earlier in the day when McKay wasn't home, then later that Tuesday night. He had reportedly breached a court condition. Police said there was a confrontation. Sources confirmed that McKay had an edged weapon and that the new officer fired his gun in response. McKay, a father of two with a four-page rap sheet, died later in hospital. The officer in question had only been on the job a month. He was part of this class that was sworn in in October. Both he and the female officer have been placed on administrative leave. Regular procedure when an incident like that happens. The fatal encounter was not McKay's first run-in with the law. He was charged three days earlier with assault and breaching a court order. McKay's family says he had two young children and was trying to turn his life around. Uh, Police Chief family. Joe Boland turned down CBC's request for an interview while the investigation is ongoing. But the RNC did provide answers to questions about recruits in the field. The force says a senior officer provides guidance to the recruit for the first year on the job. And no matter the years of service, all officers are trained and certified on the use of force continuum, a guide that determines what level of force is appropriate. Recruits also have access to the same equipment as any other frontline officer. As for the OPP, its investigators have now left Cornerbrook and will continue their investigation. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. A Stephenville woman is dead after a highway crash last night near Cornerbrook. Pieces of an SUV were scattered along the side of the Trans-Canada Highway west of Pinchgut Lake. A collision analyst continues to investigate the wreckage. The Ford Escape collided with a transport truck and the 72-year-old passenger was pronounced dead at the scene. The man driving was airlifted to the Health Sciences Centre in St. John's with serious injuries. Police say the transport truck driver wasn't hurt. Emergency crews responded to the scene after 7 p.m. last night. Well, a year from the provincial election and a new poll suggests the province's Liberal Party has reached its highest level of support among decided voters since early 2016. Of people that Corporate Research Associates surveyed last month, 46% of decided voters chose the Liberals. That's a steady increase since May and the highest percentage of support for the ruling party since February 2016, when it sat at 66%. The Progressive Conservatives' numbers were unchanged since the last CRA poll in August, remaining at 35% of decided voters. The NDP dipped slightly in the new poll, going from 19% support in August to 17%. 
Now to politics in the United States today. Michael Cohen is going to serve a three-year prison sentence for crimes that he committed during his time as President Donald Trump's lawyer. Cohen apologized today in a New York court. He told the judge that he had, quote, blind loyalty to Trump, and that led him to cover up his dirty deeds. Cohen pleaded guilty to making false statements to the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee. He also pleaded guilty to eight other counts, including campaign finance violations. Cohen closed his eyes as the judge pronounced the sentence. The 52-year-old said he was following Trump's direction. Cohen is going to surrender on March 6th to start his prison term. He is the first member of Trump's circle to implicate the president in a crime. British Prime Minister Theresa May has survived a confidence vote in Parliament. Uh, the result uh, of the ballot uh, held this evening is that the Parliamentary Party does have confidence. Yeah. Conservative MPs voted 200 to 117 in favour of keeping her as leader. May announced earlier in the day that she would not run in the next British election. She also warned that political disaster awaited if she lost the vote. May has vowed to continue pursuing a Brexit deal and to involve more people in the process. Pope Francis has named a new Archbishop for St. John's. Bishop Peter Hunt, who currently oversees the Roman Catholic Diocese of Cornerbrook, Labrador is taking over. The previous Archbishop Martin Curry retired yesterday. Hunt will be installed in the new year. Well, after some chaotic Christmases, a St. John's family is going to have a very, very merry holiday season this year. Yes, here now is Meg Roberts met with the family who are feeling especially thankful for not one but two big Christmas presents. Which one? The Young's Christmas tree has been up since the middle of November. I'm sick of it already. <laughs> it's tradition in their house. Nine-year-old Ava has been battling leukemia the past few years, so her mom sets up the tree early in case they end up spending the holidays in the hospital. But not this year. Ava is in remission, and Shannon Young says that's a big relief emotionally and financially. No, it wasn't easy at all because I had to. Li I actually left my job a little while before she was diagnosed, so yeah, it was it was pretty hard. Just doing it all on my own, having to be two places at once. I mean, having to get my son to school and having to be there with her because I spent nights every night in the Janeway with her. On top of the good bill of health, another Christmas gift. Only this one came with a shiny red bow. Young was this year's recipient of the Collision Clinic's car giveaway. The auto shop gave her a reconstructed car along with the full year of vehicle registration and insurance. 15 years, very hard to believe. Um, it's always a time of year for us when it's emotional and we feel really good about uh, helping somebody. It's a hand up. What does this car mean to your family? Oh God, it means everything. I'm, at least we have a reliable vehicle now. I can go, but I can go back to work um, until September, until I go back to school. I mean, I have a reliable vehicle if they need to go somewhere. It's crazy. I can't even like I can't even put it into words. How I like. I mean, I just it's it's amazing that people do stuff like that. It just it felt so good today. Young says she's still anxious about her daughter's cancer returning, but for now it will be much easier to relax. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Some of the best curlers in the world are in CBS this week, and the town is hoping that they can benefit from that. I'm Jeremy Eaton, and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now.
talk back. And before we get to the weather, something I want to show you. We all know that uh, kids love to play in the snow, but mm -hmm. horses do too. Take a look at these. So just look at these horses. Uh, this is the first big snowfall on the Avalon last week, and they were enjoying it. The big horse that you'll see in this video is Flash, and the American miniature horses are Peanut, Dolly, Twister, Buddy, and Little Zeus. Uh, little Zeus, so they're obviously having a lot of fun out there. Um, there they go, you can't really blame them. Judy Moss and Torbay owns them. And if you've ever been to the downtown Christmas parade, as you were this year, Ashley, um, they're often a star attraction, those little miniature horses. And now they're going to have tons more time to play in the snow. Oh, good. <laughs> Especially with all, uh, all of this snow falling right now. Looking at, uh, mention between, we have four centimeters on the ground right now, and it's quite uh, chilly out there with that wind chill. Yeah. Take a look at the current temperatures right now, sitting only in the minus single digits, so it's not that bad, but you factor in that wind chill, it's feeling closer to minus 12 in St. John's, minus 32 in Labrador City. And we are going to see these continue, these wind chills continue as we head through the night tonight because those winds are going to continue to strengthen. So here's a look at the current winds right now in St. John's out of the northeast at 43 kilometers per hour. Factor in those wind gusts. We're seeing gusts closer to 61. Cape Race showing 83 uh, kilometers per hour. And that's exactly what we're going to see as we head through the next couple of hours. The winds will eventually die down a little bit as we head towards the morning hours but still looking at blowing snow through tomorrow morning. So here's a look at that satellite and radar. We saw some heavy snow push through. Now the low is beginning to pull away and most of that heavy snow is offshore right now, but we're still going to see uh, a couple more hours, probably uh, between four or five more hours of some heavier snow at times before that tapers to flurries into uh, into towards the morning hours. And then uh, along the west coast, we are still seeing that uh, onshore flow flurries as well. So we do have that blowing snow advisory. That's because we've got those stronger winds and that snow falling. Uh, here's a look at that. That will continue more than likely towards the morning. But this is what we're looking at as far as snowfall goes uh, by tomorrow morning. So as I mentioned, about four centimeters has already fallen or been recorded in St. John's. Looking at somewhere between 10, maybe as high as 15 centimeters by morning, but more than likely closer to that 10 centimeter mark. Down through the southwest, that's or uh, southeast rather, that's where we're going to see the most snow. So Somewhere between 15 to 20 centimeters is a good bet. Otherwise, 5 to 10 for the rest of the Avalon, creeping towards um, potentially Clarenville as we head into the morning. And then otherwise, we're looking at a trace to maybe 5 centimeters, a little bit more expected along uh, the west coast. And then maybe even Gander could pick up about 5 to 10 centimeters through the night tonight uh, as we see a little bit of bands of uh, snow move through. So. This is what we're looking at as so we head through the night tonight into tomorrow. Again, those lingering flurries towards the morning hours and then things will eventually clear out and it looks like an absolutely lovely day up through Labrador as well with uh, just a mix of sun and cloud through the afternoon. But uh, overnight tonight temperatures dipping into the minus teens for parts of central minus 14 for Grand Falls winds are otherwise minus single digits and then again that chance of flurries. Those strong northeast winds will continue along the coast uh, up through Labrador minus 30 going down to for Labrador City with that wind chill feeling closer to minus 37. Happy Valley Goose Bay seeing those similar wind chills as well. And then into tomorrow, temperatures are actually going to drop through the day down to the minus single digits, even more so as we head through the night tomorrow. But uh, generally seeing those skies clear out and then a beautiful day on tap for Labrador. Again, uh, Lab City minus 17 temperatures a little bit warmer along the coast. So that's a look at tomorrow's forecast. We'll look a little bit ahead because there could potentially be some rain on the way for the weekend. We'll have all those details coming up. Deb? Thank you, Ashley. Well, as you heard last night, the Pinty's Grand Slam of Curling is in Conception Bay South this week, and the town couldn't be happier. The municipality has spent a long time trying to snag the Grand Slam, so they're taking advantage of the moment and the national audience it brings. Here now as Jeremy Eaton explains. <laughs> It's not every day some of the top curlers in the world glide over the Conception Bay South Town logo. It's something that we've been working on for an excess of a year, and of course it has international implications. I mean, it's showcasing our beautiful town to the world, and uh, we're super excited. With elite athletes on the ice the main focus, it didn't take long for event passes to sell out. 
it's also a nationally televised event. So the town took advantage of that, buying airtime for two tourism-type commercials about CBS. It just points out, uh, you know, the benefits of living and uh, working in Conception Bay South. Uh, we're just so, so happy and so excited about it. But it takes an entire town to pull this off and a lot of volunteers. You know, 150, 200, but we're all busy, busy. The nice thing about the volunteers now is that they're all willing to pitch in. This CBS arena also needed a big team to turn the hockey ice into a world-class curling rink. They did it in about, I'd say, max 48 hours. And it was just phenomenal to watch them do it. They've done a fabulous job. Most of the players are really thrilled with the way the ice is. Team Gushu won't hit the ice until tonight, but that didn't stop fans from taking in the action earlier today. It's awesome to see it in Newfoundland. I think it's great curling. It's professional curling brought right here to our province. It's great to see. This Pinty's Grand Slam of Curling event will be here at the CBS Arena all week long, and the event is going to be on national TV, giving the town a chance to show off its community to a really big audience. And if you're interested in checking out the men's final, well, that's going to be aired on CBC on Sunday afternoon. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, Conception Bay South. Well, have you ever wanted to see your own credit report? Tonight, in the latest from our Consumer Tips series, here now's Jen White has the lowdown on credit reports. Did you know that you can access your credit report for free? Here's the lowdown on how to do it and why you should. The federal government suggests you should ask for a copy from both of the credit reporting agencies, Equifax and TransUnion, at least once a year. It's good to check that your personal and financial information is up to date and that you haven't been a victim of identity theft. You could also find mistakes, like someone else's information on your file, debts that aren't yours, or debts that you've already paid off. If you do find inaccurate info, you should contact the credit reporting agency right away. Now, what if the information you get in that report is yours, but it's bad? Credit information stays on your file for at least six years. Information like if you regularly pay on time, how much you owe, your credit limits, and a list of authorized grantors who have accessed your file. When it comes to rebuilding your credit, government says there's no point in hiring a company that claims it can do it for you, because all they can do is fix inaccuracies, and you can do that yourself for free. To check your credit report, you can apply to Equifax or TransUnion by mail. You need two pieces of government-issued ID, photocopied front and back. And you can also get it from TransUnion over the phone or online by answering some questions. Or if you're in St. John's, you can drop by their office on Topsail Road. What's not included in your credit report is your credit score. That's a three-digit number based on the information from your credit report that lenders use to make decisions about whether to loan you money. You can get your credit score along with your credit report online from both agencies for a fee. That'll cost you upwards of $20. That band is older than me. <laughs> They're celebrating a golden anniversary and still going. 50 years of the Sons of Aaron. That's ahead.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, they were one of the first bands to bring traditional Irish music to North America. The Sons of Aaron have spent much of their 50-year career playing in St. John's, and they're still performing today. In honor of their golden anniversary, Here and Now's Zach Gowdy brings you this special feature on the Sons of Aaron. It's time for me to introduce you to my special guest tonight. They're a group of young men. They've been together a long time. In fact, they were one of the first groups of their type. Will you welcome the Sons of Aaron? What does it feel like to be part of something that's celebrating a 50th anniversary? It's really extraordinary how quick it comes. In the army town, the little man, and you kept a little town, and by the strand, and the landlord, he and the daughter fair, pretty little thing with the golden hair. I tell you what, it's it's scary even to think of it. Because I'm 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 looking at this head of grey hair and I said to myself, fifty years. I said, that's wild. I'm all the ones with a big red And uh, to be still playing and with the same conviction. Yes. The key element is Ralph's passion. Ralph's passion for traditional music and his connection with Ireland. I personally would call Ralph the godfather of traditional Newfoundland and Irish music. Oh, absolutely. I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> <laughs> that band is older than me. The Sons of Aaron, uh, that's it. They're the only ones left. I mean, there's no Ryan's Fancy. There, there's no big traditional Irish bands anymore. It's just the Sons of Aaron. The Dubliners are done. Everybody's done. And the Sons of Aaron are still going. I and mean, we're getting bigger. When the band strikes up, the dancing starts. You know what I mean? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a, a, it's a thing that you can't take away from you. How did you get the name? Sons of Ireland. Sons of Aaron being uh, Aaron who's dead for Ireland. Yeah. Oh, somewhere, somebody's waiting for you, you, you. The funny thing is, I was in, in Dublin in a bar, and my friend, Gary Cavanagh, was going to Canada. And I was, I was a bit of a, a wanderer. So I said to him, I said, I'll see you there. Somewhere is somebody waiting for you, you, you. We played in, uh, in Toronto, the first place we played, and we were getting free beer, which was uh, uh, 10 cents a draft, and you, you got five of them, and that was your pay. So there was myself and Dermot, Fergus, and Gary Cavanagh. That was the original Sons of Aaron. And we kind of started in, in the house, uh, playing the, and said, boys, we should go down and play. So we played and the rest is history. Somewhere, somebody's waiting for you, you, you. We toured from one end of North America to the other. The best move we ever made was into Newfoundland. And uh, because there was an acceptance straight away. There's a lot of people here of Irish extraction. You know what I mean? Parts of, uh, uh, of English, but mostly Irish. So we, would, we took the music out of the, out of the kitchens, put them on stage. We get the response. That's the thing after 50 years that, you know, the fans are just, they, they enjoy it. They love to the, the come see the band, so. Yeah, they're still saying, really? You're still together? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is Ralph still alive? <laughs> uh. <laughs> are you Ralph's son? That's the most, that's the most common ass one. Are you all the sons of Ralph? That's a hell of an accomplishment for 50 years. And look where we're going. Still moving up. Still getting bigger. It's probably because of me. It, well, I was going to say that. Yeah. You, know, you and me. My, well, okay, well your bass playing and my, my vocals. You feel the history behind it when you join the band, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a big thing. When people go out, when they come down here and the Sons of Aaron are playing, they want to hear us playing these songs. Yep. That's what I think they do. 
They don't want to hear anything else. After all these years, do you still need to rehearse these songs? Uh, well, more than more than ever, yeah, because I forget them now and then. See, you know what I mean? So don't tell anybody. Some parts of it uh, you keep going smooth, but other parts you tend to forget things you did 20 odd years ago. And now we're playing some songs we haven't played in 10 years, and it seems like they're brand new to us again. God bless and you know, and, and the thing about the songs is, you know, and still a great band, love the boys and everything, but it's Ralph. And Ralph is the son of Ralph Eric. Ralph is the son of Eric. Yeah. <laughs> He's of the Eric. son of Eric. Yeah. And he, he put this great crowd around him to make music. But at the end of the day, it's one dude's 50th anniversary of his route. Where the heck are we? Upstairs over Aaron's Pub in what used to be known as the Irish Center. Used to be. Hey? Used to be known as the Irish Center, yeah. Ralph used to bring over some, some acts from Ireland and stuff and some local acts and put off concerts up there. It was always a great time. It looked a little bit different than it does today. <laughs> the sea, oh, the sea, the wonderful sea. We started off more bands. Wednesday, we'd have a, a happy hour kind of thing. It was a talent show. Chris and Mark were playing as, as solo actors. And then we said, boys, why don't you put, go together? And you know what I mean? that will be a nice sound. The sea, oh, the sea, the wonderful sea. Long I never knew Mark. We were both double booked downstairs. Uh, instead of sending one of us home, uh, Ralph put two of us up on stage and we play together and we've been doing it for 25 years now. You know, if it wasn't for Ralph throwing us up on the stage, we wouldn't be sitting here doing this interview who, who today. Who knows, that's right. Well, the first time I saw Sons of Aaron, I think, would have been at the pub. I mean, when I started uh, coming to St. John's and working in St. John's in the mid-1980s, when I was still probably 16. And we used to go down and I'd watch, that's where I saw Ralph and the Sons of Aaron for the first time, and, and it was Ram. I think the biggest influence uh, from those guys for, on me early on was the stagemanship that Ralph always had. He knew how to turn a noisy pub into a sing-along almost instantly. I have a deep respect for that craft about how to turn, you know, a noisy bar into a great night out. And the, the biggest things I learned from him and from that band was really about how to work a crowd. And nobody did that better than Ralph. Certainly Ralph was the start of up of all this, as far as I'm concerned. You know, starting the Irish at, the, at Aaron's Pub. And uh, he was a blessing to everybody, and I think he, he was the inspiration for all these other bands to come along. We used to go into the Strand, and they used to play, and we used to dance, and we used to have a lovely, lovely time. And we loved him. they become part of my life. We re really have. And, Pretty well, everyone that's been a member has been a personal friend. I grew up on your, I grew up on your songs. He, the little fellow said to me, he says, I grew up on your music. He says, <laughs> I, God love me. He's only what about time. Well, you've raised a lot of children. <laughs> <laughs> Does it ever amaze you that there's still an audience for this kind of music? It, it never ceases to amaze me. 
but especially 50 years gone by, how quick it's gone by, and we're still at it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the Lifetime Achievement Award is the highest honor bestowed by Music and L. This year's recipient is Ralph O'Brien. This award tonight is 50 years for me. That's 50 years from now. And that fella. I mean, which is, which is wonderful. And it, it's very nice to be that people appreciate what you've done and how you've done it, you know what I mean? Through the course of the years. No. It's inspirational in a way, but I think, you know, I, I think Ralph would agree that there's only one thing that drives that, right? And that's a love for doing it. Nothing else. There's no money that could make you do it. You know, there's no great night outs, there's no sex, drugs, and rock and roll that could make you do it that long. The only reason you would do it that long is because you love it. And, you, you know, you watch Ralph sing and it doesn't take very long where you go like, he loves it. And, and that's beautiful. Fifty years is remarkable. Congratulations, Ralph. Yeah, it's fantastic. Absolutely, congratulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the Sons of Aaron. We saw a bit of uh, video in yep. Zach's piece. Uh, from a long time ago, because the band spent an awful lot of time right in this right here. studio, right. yeah, and uh, they would record performances. It was all part of CBC's variety yeah. show. Blast from the past. Yeah, it's very <laughs> nice. Your life is before cancer and after cancer. A man from Grand Falls, Windsor, is part of a new online resource for young adults with a life-threatening disease. Just ahead, meet Matt Ralph. Welcome back to Here Now. Matt Ralph was 22 when doctors first found a cancerous tumor in his brain. He's had 30 rounds of radiation therapy and endless MRIs since that first diagnosis. And now he's one of the voices featured in livingoutloud.life. 
It's a new online resource for young adults with life-threatening diseases. Here now is Garrett Barry visited Ralph in Grand Falls, Windsor. One evening I decided to have a nap and when I woke up I was surrounded by paramedics and being taken to the emergency room. Um, I had an MRI and went home and um, there was already a message on the answering machine saying you need to come back and speak to an oncologist and um, they usually don't do that for good news. I saw it as a roadblock and something that would put my life on hold for about six months, um, maybe a bit longer, but after that, um, my life trajectory would have gone back to normal. But it doesn't work that way. My main support with respect to cancer, I think was my grandmother. And she was a two-time um, breast cancer survivor. And she finally died of uterine cancer. But, um, you know, I got a lot of support from her, but after my first, after my recurrence, which happened just a couple of months after her death, I felt really alone and started thinking more about this kind of stuff. You often feel isolated because your peers aren't really equipped to have discussions about things like cancer and, um, possible death or hospice or whatnot. And they are well-meaning, but I don't feel they have, they don't feel safe or able to begin those kinds of conversations or, or to reach out. So for patients um, seeing the website, they are able to have a really good general grasp of the kinds of challenges that will be presented to them. Um, either they can be introduced to these things or they can gain a sense of community and belonging and realizing that they're perfectly normal to experience what they're feeling. Cancer doesn't feel invasive to me. Genetically, it's something that most of us are born with. If you made a down payment on something that a company doesn't provide you, you wouldn't expect to keep paying, would you? Well, that is a predicament some former customers of Sears Canada are facing. They bought warranties the company will never honor. But when one man stopped pay making those payments, the threatening phone calls began. The CBC's Yvonne Colbert has this story. Mike Albany bought four high-end appliances along with an extended warranty from Sears in 2015. Last year, before it closed its doors, the company announced it would not honour those warranties, but people were still expected to pay for them. It promised the money collected would be credited to the final payment. Albany paid off his account except for the warranty payments owed after Sears closed. But now Scotiabank, which owns the Sears accounts, is telling him to pay $600 for the warranty or face damaged credit. They said, you know, just pay the bill and, and it'll be no more of a headache. Why worry for such an amount? Um, and Scotiabank leads me to believe that uh, my credit history is going to be uh, blemished if I don't pay at least a minimum bill by the uh, December 19th. Albany says he feels like Scotiabank is holding his credit rating for ransom. It's not ethical to charge people the way that they're, they're doing it for service that's not been provided now or in the future. Scotiabank says as it was Sears which sold the warranty and it was Sears that was paid at the time of the purchase, unfortunately, this is a situation that customers have to resolve directly with Sears. But that's not possible because Sears has shut down. The firm handling the closure says extended warranty holders are considered unsecured creditors and they'll have to wait for court decisions before finding out whether they'll get any of their money back. This is the kind of story that, that um, amplifies you know, the, the standard worries about, uh, you know, about what business is all about. Uh, worries that companies are really only out for the bottom line and, and don't care that much about about their, uh, about their customers. 
Mike Albany must now decide whether to pay Scotiabank or risk damage to his credit. To add insult to injury, three of his four appliances need repairs, so he has to pay out of pocket, plus continue to pay the warranty, which should have covered some of that cost. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. Journalists who were targeted or killed for their work are being honoured as Time Magazine's Person of the Year. The magazine put out four different covers. One is dedicated to Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Also featured, two Reuters journalists who were sent to prison in Myanmar, as well as the head of online Philippine news site Rappler, and the staff of the Capital Gazette in Maryland. Five people died when a gunman went on a rampage inside that newspaper's office back in June. like outside uh, just checked about six centimeters is now on the ground outside in St. John's looks like rain is on the way though for the weekend I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up are we sending it back out there Ashley no okay <laughs> <laughs> All right, so snow's coming down pretty good right now outside the studio here. Yes, it is. And uh, looking ahead, we went for a little bit of some quiet uh, weather days, which is welcome, I'm sure. So we'll take a look at the forecast uh, as we head into Friday. Uh, things generally staying quite calm. Now we are going to see some snow move in for parts of Labrador, though. Uh, that should move in Friday evening as we start to see this, uh, the future tracker bring in that snow. And uh, we'll continue to do so as we head through the overnight into Saturday. And then we'll start to see some snow um, for parts of the West Coast as well. So here's a look at those temperatures, though, uh, staying uh, below zero again for the most part across the island. Again, that chance of flurries along the west coast gander could see a few flakes as well and then up through labrador those temperatures warming quite significantly from what we've been seeing for the past little bit minus 10 in lab city uh, minus 7 in happy valley goose bay and Nain. similar temperature there looks like most of that sunshine should be along the coast through the day on friday so 
Uh, looking ahead Friday overnight into Saturday. That's when we're looking at a little bit of a warm up. So here's that next weather maker. Uh, we're going to start to see that southerly flow for the Avalon, the Beer and Peninsula and the south coast. So that's where we could see that potential for some rain depending on those temperatures though. Right now there's a little bit of disagreement whether we're going to see uh, just above zero or significantly above zero and that will be the determining factor. Otherwise, it looks like snow uh, for the rest of at least central and the west coast as well into the afternoon. Then we get into that colder flow and behind it, things will change over to that chance of flurries and then uh, more snow on the way up through Labrador as well through the day on Sunday. Into uh, the rest of Sunday afternoon, things will clear out and then Monday again, maybe just a few cloudy periods, but we'll start to get into uh, a little bit of a quiet period for weather as well. So that's definitely good news there. So here's a look at the five day forecast for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland, looking at those windy conditions continuing right through Friday, but there's that warm up. So the warm up right now looks like it'll happen Saturday night into Sunday, where those warmest temperatures will be again, either Either rain or snow depending on that temperature and then the winds really going to pick up again on Sunday night. Uh, we could see gusts close to 90 maybe even 100 kilometers per hour again as that system uh, uh, strengthens as it tracks a little bit further east and then Monday will drop back down and then we're looking at that potential for some flurries as well. Now for uh, central Newfoundland, uh, rain or snow again on Saturday and then into Sunday that chance of flurries will continue those temperatures cold tomorrow and then warming up and then dropping back down uh, towards the beginning of next week with that chance of flurries moving in late day one more time. And then for western Newfoundland, same thing, not as cold uh, tomorrow though. And then Friday sitting around minus one, temperatures plus one. So hovering just above the zero degree mark for Saturday, again, either rain or snow possible. And then Monday is when we'll see that uh, sunshine return for the most part. So for Eastern Labrador, there's those temperatures minus 14 tomorrow. That wind chill still feeling closer to minus 22. And then we're looking at uh, sunshine for the rest of the weekend and then Western Labrador as well. Nice warm up on the way. So just before we go to break, I want to share this weather photo with you. So the nice scene. Sweet. Nice lights. That's the basin, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. You're right. You, you made them easy of late. I know, well, because they're gorgeous photos. Good. So I just choose the beautiful they are beautiful ones. Beautiful, yeah, yep. absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So I'll gorgeous tell you. and simple, just and the way I like simple. them. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you who sent in this gorgeous shot when we come back after the break.
Okay, it was an easy picture tonight. Who sent it? It was just gorgeous. Beautiful photo, obviously, in St. John's. Mm -hmm. uh, this photo was sent to us by John Williams. I shot Don. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous Christmas colors at Fort Amherst. Yeah, and just down. Which way is the Fort Amherst? Be straight down there, is right there. over that way yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. over on the right. right. And uh, it's kind of deceptive, but uh, Signal Hill is on the left. But that's the very lower part mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the hill over there. Yeah. Beauty. Lovely shots. Getting some gorgeous photos uh, lately. So if you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Okay. So we have time for another viewer photo, but this one is from Nova Scotia. What? Oh. Oh, wow. Okay, we'll make an exception for this one. <laughs> That's really Beautiful. Pretty. This is yep. uh, photographer Adam Cornick set up this shot on a pond near Peggy's Cove. You can see the lighthouse yeah. there in the background. Mm -hmm. He says it took a while waiting for a moment when there was no snow on the ice since sharing on social media. Apparently Cornick says he's had a great response from people calling it the perfect East Coast experience. It is beautiful, isn't it? I'd yeah. say. Is it like a Canadian's Leafs fight about to erupt on that? Or <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks blue? that way. Uh -huh. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. I know who you'd be See, rooting for. I'm not making any comments. Canadian's My fan oh. there. <laughs> that's right. I guess it would be. Well, it'll be yeah, well, wouldn't be Toronto, but I know that's that's fighting words in this <laughs> part of the country. So. And yeah. just a few seconds to talk about uh, Feed NL, Anthony. That's right. Uh, of course, we've got our big event uh, this Friday at the Avalon Mall. Our show is going to be coming from there. Um, and the, the CBC building itself is open all day. We'll be accepting your cash and non-perishable food items for the Community Food Association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we're going to be at the Avalon Mall as well, you wrapping can, some of your gifts. Mm -hmm. You can swing by and see a lot yes. of us over <laughs> yeah. there. Have a great night. Good night.